Hello everyone and welcome to this video on academic skills. In this particular video I will be discussing academic writing. I'll first tell you a bit more about the different forms of academic writing, then we'll discuss why academic writing is frequently so absolutely terrible, and finally I'm going to conclude by giving you some advice on how to do better. But first, why should you care about academic writing? Well, the written word is arguably the most common way to communicate academic findings. And while this means that academia generates, hopefully, a lasting body of knowledge that adheres to fairly clear expectations, the reliance on the written text can also be a problem. Academics are often not trained to speak plainly, to visualize their findings, or to communicate them digitally through various kinds of social media. But be that as it may, we ultimately have to accept that academia privileges writing, and if you are a student or an academic, you have no choice but to learn to write for academic consumption. What this means varies widely from discipline to discipline. For example, much of the humanities prefer long-form writing, especially books, which tend to be crucial for academic advancement. Other disciplines of course also produce monographs, but in much of the natural sciences and some of the social sciences, the most important type of output is the research article. But here too, conventions on how to structure such writing differ strongly. For example, in much of the social sciences, research articles adhere to a fairly rigid structure. They open with an introduction, and then they move through a literature review, a methodology section, a section that presents the results of the study, and then a discussion of the results. These elements are kept separate, so you would not normally find, for example, discussions of other people's work in the results section of such a paper. The advantage of such a structure is that readers know precisely what to expect, and they may not need to read the entire article. Simply skimming the results section and reading the discussion will provide a fair impression of what the study achieved. Humanities articles, on the other hand, do not always have such a clearly defined structure. They are more flexible, and while they can contain standardized elements, especially literature reviews, they often mix such reviews with original findings and personal observations in order to create a more argumentative piece of writing. This creates more diverse articles that can be more interesting to read as a whole, but they can also be more difficult to get a handle on. I'm telling you about these conventions because they translate directly into the demands of university programs. If you are a university student, then your instructors are bound to expect you to write in accordance with the conventions in your chosen field of study. Your writings will have to emulate the protocols of professional public work, whether you are writing a PhD thesis, a graduate or undergraduate thesis, or a term paper. So, if you are writing, for instance, a thesis in political science, you may very well need to include and keep carefully separate your literature review, a methodology section, and your findings and discussions. The same thesis in art history might have rather different demands, so make sure to check your program conventions and to discuss the matter with your instructors. Of course, there are plenty of other types of academic writing that students have to complete in university programs. The following are just a few typical examples. You might, for instance, have to write a research proposal, which introduces a research question or hypothesis and then discusses the data and methods you plan to use in order to address your core issue. Some university courses might ask students to write only one of the sections that make up a larger research paper, for example, only the methodology, or only an analysis, or that will be an explanation of how and why something works the way it does. Especially in undergraduate courses, it is quite common to write standalone literature reviews which are meant to contrast the various arguments and findings in a body of scholarly work, using references to map out a specific debate or an issue area. A small-scale version of that sort of writing is the review essay, which summarizes, compares and contrasts a small number of academic sources, sometimes as few as two or three. Then there are essays that are supposed to describe a particular thing or event, while other essays might demand that you critique a particular piece of work, whether it is a piece of writing, a film, an art object or something else. Yet other formats would ask you to try and persuade the reader of a specific position, in which case you'd likely state your point of view, then discuss counter-arguments and finally try to dismiss them to draw your own conclusions. 
as you can see, there are plenty of formats that are common in academia, and larger projects like full research papers may combine some of these shorter forms, for instance by first reviewing and contrasting existing literature, then introducing a research methodology, next describing and analyzing a particular set of original materials like, say, policy documents, propaganda films, or original interviews with research participants, and finally laying out an argument about how to make sense of these materials and draw conclusions from them. Putting all of these elements together in writing is extremely rewarding, as is reading a truly excellent and engaging piece of research. Regrettably, however, much of the professional literature that gets produced in academia is not well written at all. In fact, some books and articles can seem puzzling, even positively arcane, and reading them can be a real punishment that is often deeply frustrating, even infuriating. Why is that? Well, let me give you an example, which I am taking from an excellent book by Michael Billick called Learn to Write Badly, How to Succeed in the Social Sciences. Take a look at this sentence, which comes from a psychology study of mental disorder. Here's what the authors wrote. Such multivariate strategies may be of more use in understanding the genetic factors which contribute to vulnerability to psychiatric disorders than strategies based on the assumption that the presence or absence of psychopathology is dependent on a major gene, or than strategies in which a single biological variable is studied. Now, this is almost impossible to understand, even if you are a psychologist, and the problem is not that the quote is out of context. The writing is simply terrible. So, what is wrong with this piece of text? For starters, it is far too long. The single sentence has 50 words, many with four or five syllables. By the time we reach the end, we've already forgotten what the beginning was about. In fact, most people can only process chunks of text that are about 12 words long, so a sentence like this is not helpful. But the structure is also a problem. Notice how the authors write about how some strategies are more useful than others, but then they insert an entire clause in the middle, tearing apart sections of the sentence that belong together, so more use than what? And as if once wasn't enough, the authors actually do this twice, hedging even further and adding yet more information to what could otherwise have been a fairly simple sentence. It is also unclear who the actor is in the sentence. This is in part because the sentence uses constant passive phrases, but also because the implied subject changes several times, making it almost impossible to keep track of who is supposed to be doing what. Then there is the jargon. Words like multivariate strategies and psychopathology may not be intuitively understandable to a general audience. You'd have to be deeply socialized into the lingo of this particular academic field to make sense of such specialized words. So this sentence is a pretty epic fail, and that raises the question, couldn't all of this have been expressed in simple, plain English? What might that have looked like? Well, Billick has rephrased this for us to show how the subject matter does not actually have to be this complicated. This is his version of the sentence. If researchers are to understand the genetic factors that make some patients vulnerable to psychiatric disorders, they should use multivariate strategies rather than strategies in which the researchers study only a single biological variable. Now, there's still a bit of jargon in the sentence that deserves to be explained and maybe even replaced with clearer, shorter words, but at least now the sentence has a clear subject. Researchers. And those researchers well, they are doing things in ways that we can understand. This is certainly much better, so why don't more academics write like this? This is actually a complex question. It might be tempting to say that many scholars intentionally write obscurely. If only a small group of like-minded initiates can understand an article or book, then that is a great way for authors to immunize themselves against criticism. Complex writing can also leave the impression that the content itself is profound, and that can make the author seem particularly smart. So writing in stilted, complicated language can be a way to try and make an argument and its author seem more legitimate. Now, I'm sure there are academics that choose to write badly, either consciously or subconsciously for such self-serving reasons, but I suspect that most authors slide into these bad patterns of writing because of other reasons. I can think of five. First, most academics may be well-trained in their respective discipline, but they are rarely well-trained in writing. 
In fact, higher levels of academic education like graduate and postgraduate degrees pay shockingly little attention to communicative skills and it is very rare indeed to see higher professionals receive further writing training. Everyone seems to assume that communicative skills are simply something that academics will pick up, but sadly that is not always the case. A second issue is that each discipline develops its own conventions, often uncritically, and those conventions become so standardized that everyone expects them. That kind of peer pressure and peer policing can then lead to the use of jargon and other horrible writing practices that members of that specific field no longer notice, but that makes their writing inaccessible to everyone else. Take for instance the use of personal pronouns. Some disciplines insist that students and scholars alike delete any mention of themselves from their work. It is simply unacceptable in such fields to write, I will analyze this topic, or I did the following with my data. In an attempt to generate a sense of objectivity, writers are supposed to use passive clauses instead, for instance, this topic was analyzed, or the following was done with the data. Now, we can all agree that passive phrases are poor writing. They make sentences more complicated than they need to be. But maybe more importantly, they delete the subject from the sentence. This leads to an impersonal style in which scholars pretend they do not need to take responsibility for their choices, and it even has conceptual consequences, for instance when it is not clear who is in charge of a specific process. And yet, an entrenched convention like this pushes authors to keep writing in a passive, non-committal voice, and we're all worse off because of it. Indeed, once you get used to the sort of convoluted passive writing style that is so common in academia, it can become a habit to write this way. It takes a great deal of work to identify who is doing what in each and every argument. Writing clearly is hard. Simply slapping down some vague passive clauses and lazy chains of nouns is so much easier, especially if everyone else is also doing it. There's little positive reinforcement for going the extra mile, so it is understandable that many academics would ask themselves, why even bother? Then there is the fact that many scholars today do not write in their native language. Having to write in English is now pretty much demanded in most disciplines, and yet the people who now have to write for international consumption are non-native speakers, and they understandably struggle to formulate their complex thoughts clearly in a foreign language. There's then also a power dynamic at play that is very worrying, in which especially scholars from the so-called global south do not have access to the same language training and copy editing resources as scholars in more prosperous countries, and their contributions then risk being kept out of top-tier journals because they do not fulfill the language requirements that native speaker editors assume anyone should be able to produce. But that is a whole other debate. The result in any case is that people with very different levels of English language skills write academically, and if anything, instructors, editors, and other scholars with gatekeeping powers should probably check their privileges and lend others a hand who may not yet have had the opportunity to learn what clear and elegant English writing looks like. But that brings me to the final problem. Who has the time for any of this? Instructors don't have the time to give their students feedback on their writing, peer reviewers and editors do not have the time to provide constructive feedback to authors, and authors themselves do not have the time to check their manuscript several times or hand it to a colleague for proofreading because, guess what, that colleague also does not have time. With publishing pressures increasing, all amidst ever-growing teaching demands, it is entirely understandable that everyone in academia is cutting corners, and the result is sadly the kind of shoddy and sloppy writing that you get when you simply phone it in. So that should give us some idea of why academic writing is frequently so difficult to read. But how do you do better? Here's some advice on how to write academically in a way that is still clear and accessible. You can probably already gather from some of the discussion so far what the core features of good academic writing actually are. Let me give you a list of things that you can do at the level of language and then say a few things about structuring your writing in a way that makes it appealing to read. When you write, make sure to keep your sentences short and to the point. Don't hedge and don't pile on the subordinate clauses until your sentences are 70 words long. Second, use clear subjects. Make it obvious who the agent is in your sentence, who is doing something. Don't bury the actors under vague phrases and passive clauses. And that is the third piece of advice. Use active clauses. Don't write, the analysis was conducted by researchers. Write, researchers conducted the analysis. In fact, even that is still convoluted. Why write, conduct the analysis, when you can simply write, analyze? This then is the fourth point. Use verbs, not nouns. 
you will frequently see academics chain together nouns through an endless series of prepositions, like in this example. Propaganda serves to assure the legitimacy of the governance of the Communist Party of China. Let's scrap that horrible attempt at a sentence and rewrite it using active verbs, like this. The Chinese Communist Party uses propaganda to legitimate how it governs. There, much better. And finally, check your writing carefully for jargon. If you truly need to use specialist terms like hegemony, dispositive, or interstitial, make sure you explain to your readers why that is. What do these terms mean? What do they achieve? And if you can get away with defining and using them once to flag that you know the lingo of your field and then move on to write in plain English instead, your readers will thank you for it. Similarly, try to avoid rhetorical phrases. Words like obviously and naturally are among the most dangerous words in academia since what is obvious to one person does not necessarily have to be obvious to anyone else. Rhetoric and especially polemics have no place in academic writing and neither do colloquial phrases that may be alright in a conversation, but that do not translate very well to the page. As for the structure of your writing, any good essay, no matter how short or how long, needs a clear beginning and an end. So that means writing minimally an introductory and conclusion sentence, and possibly entire dedicated sections that introduce the topic and wrap it up at the end. A good introduction has some kind of hook that reels readers in, and it spells out the relevance of the topic. Research papers usually start from either a research question or a hypothesis, so these need to be stated in the introduction as well. And then there should probably be a short overview of what the reader can expect, and maybe even a statement at the end that already tells readers what the core findings are. After all, this isn't a novel, so it's okay to include spoilers at the start. The structure of the main body will then depend on the purpose of your paper and your field of study. You should ask yourself, does this paper need a standalone literature review? Do I need background sections and theory discussions? Should I include a methodology section and if so, where? Is my main section an original empirical study or a comparison of existing arguments and how can I best structure all of this to create a coherent narrative? And this is indeed crucial. Throughout your paper, make sure you are telling a coherent story. Keep in mind who the protagonists of that story are. They may not be identifiable people, they could be political institutions like states, or maybe they are things like the internet, or processes like globalization, or concepts like enlightenment. Identify those protagonists and then narrate what they are doing. This can be hard, but it will assure that you are creating an engaging shape for your paper, and it will prevent you from going on unnecessary tangents that do not contribute to the story. As you construct the body of your paper, think about what each section and potential subsection will cover. You may even want to plot out the structure by writing down a single keyword for each paragraph that you plan to write. This will assure that each paragraph indeed deals with a single identifiable issue, question or argument, so that you do not cover several things in any single block of text. Of course, if you are developing an argument, keep in mind that this argument should be balanced and nuanced, so you should probably reserve some paragraphs to explicitly anticipate real or potential counter-arguments to your case. This assures that you don't end up writing a one-sided argument. Finally, there is the conclusion. Minimally, you should briefly sum up what the core argument was and state what you make of all of this. Do you have an opinion? You probably should. The conclusion is where you can offer your personal assessment. Longer papers might demand more involved conclusions and in such cases you should probably include a paragraph or two on the limitations of your work and ideally a justification of why these limitations aren't a problem. It is also common to provide advice for future research that might now follow from your work, not just in terms of what might fix the limitations, but also in terms of what kind of studies could now build on the contribution that you have made. Did your work raise interesting new questions? And what kind of data and what kind of methodology could answer these questions? It is good practice to already offer practical advice. And finally, and I cannot stress this enough, do not end with the limitations or the open questions. End with your main contribution. Return to the relevance. Return to the big picture. Tell your readers why reading this paper or essay mattered. And spell out for them what the main takeaway should be. I hope you found this advice on academic writing useful. If you have, you'll find more information on academic work on my website, politicsisasia.com, and I hope to see you again in a future video.